Amen, church. You may be seated. We have sung some great truth this morning. One of my favorite lines this morning is, One name is higher than any grave. One name is higher than any throne. We gather this morning <laughs> in one of the most powerful nations in the world, and we declare that those who rule over power, uh, over nations, are secondary to the one we sing to, the God of all creation. His word is true. Uh, what a great weekend. We have a lot to celebrate. Our kids and adults were at uh, the Reality Conference this weekend. We had 25 kids and adults up there. Uh, the theme of the conference was, the, it is written, basically the reliability of God's word. And uh, what, a, what a joy to, to know that our kids were drinking in some good stuff, as well as our adults. And uh, I came over last night to pick up Levi, and uh, the adults looked a little tired. <laughs> but what I saw in our kids, a lot of love for each other. And I'm really thankful for that. Well, turn with me in your Bibles this morning to uh, Exodus uh, 8 this morning, and can we just get the elephant out of the room? We don't want any distractions this morning. Some of you are thinking, why did Pastor Ty not shave this week? It's really distracting. <laughs> Let's just say it's, uh, it's an attempt at a father-son bonding experience. So um, the question will be how much of bonding to get experience it is for me and my wife, but uh, <laughs> we'll work through it. So uh, don't worry, it won't last forever uh, for those of you who are distracted. <laughs> Exodus chapter 8 this morning. As you're turning, I have one more important thing to share with you. Brock and Angela are going to be relocating to Minnesota next weekend. <laughs> so uh, gear up. Uh, we'll let you know as we get more details about when we can show up to help them and just let's give them, let, let's just give them a, 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 an unusual Minnesota welcome. Can we do that? Uh, let's throw off all of our uh, stoicism. There isn't much here, actually. Uh, and let's just uh, give them a warming, warm, loving welcome uh, back to Minnesota and to Trinity. Let's pray. God in heaven. Everything and anything on this earth is but a speck of dust before you. You alone are God. You alone are infinite and eternal and almighty and all wise and everywhere always present. And only you could extend such grace to rebellious worms and love them into beauty through your own self-sacrifice at the hands of our wretchedness. Lord, this morning, if if for just a moment we could see a glimpse of your greatness. Oh, how it would change us. How it would change the way we think and what we see, what we feel, what we believe, what we long for, what we desire, what we rejoice in. God, would you, through the pages of Scripture this morning, give us a glimpse of your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we come to Exodus chapters 8 through 10 this morning uh, of Exodus, we are, we're going to be, be able to clearly see why we've entitled this series that the world may know the glory of Yahweh. 
As we launch into the ten plagues of Egypt this morning, it's important for you to understand that the plagues of Egypt are deeply theological. What I mean by that this morning is that um, every one of the plagues that we're going to see today is a decimation of, of Egyptians, of, the, of Egypt's gods, their false gods. There's a great summary statement in Numbers chapter 33, verse 4, which says that makes it clear that God was bringing judgment on Egypt's gods. So this is not just about God and Pharaoh. This is not just about God freeing the Israelites from oppression. This is about God displaying His glory to the world in such a way that every false god is humiliated and shown to be vain and nothing. God is demonstrating His glory to the world for every generation, including this one, to know that He stands alone as the all-glorious God with no rivals. I've included in your bulletin this morning a chart for you, for those of you who love charts, um, to show you that there are three cycles of plagues with each cycle increasingly Increasing in intensity until the tenth and final plague, which we'll get to next week. So today we're going to cover, we, we saw plague one last week. We're going to cover plagues two through nine this week, believe it or not. And then um, we'll see plague ten next week. But I want you to see on this chart, when you look at the far right column, is that every single, every single plague was an attack, an assault on many of the Egyptian gods. That's what this is about. And the message of, of each plague is the same. Yahweh is the Lord and there is no other. His glory is unrivaled in all the earth. Say it with me. Yahweh is the Lord and there is no other. His glory is unrivaled in all the earth. This is the message of each and every plague. Show us His supremacy as the one true living God. So, as we think about Exodus 8-10 through 10 this morning, I want you to keep in mind that there is only one proper response to Yahweh, and that is to bow in worship and loving surrender to the God who rules the hearts of kings, who renders superpowers powerless, who exposes false gods as vain, and whose arsenal of weapons is unlimited, to execute justice on this earth. This is God, and there is no other. And our response to this God will be the defining factor of our lives and all of our eternity. So let me attempt to summarize for you the heart of these three chapters this way. There's only one true God who is sovereign over creation, sovereign over mankind, ruling with justice toward his enemies and mercy toward his people to display his glory as matchless and supreme. All that to say, the, the one thing you must see in Exodus 8-10 through 10 this morning is not the plagues, not Moses, not Pharaoh, not the Egyptians, not their gods. You need to see the God of heaven. Plagues of Egypt are impressive. They are. But I need to point out to you this morning, there's an even greater rendering of judgment yet to come on this earth. It's revealed in the book of Revelation, particularly Revelation 16. I'm going to be referring to Revelation 16 quite a bit this morning because I want you to see we stand between two enormous realities the past exodus that God, where God has displayed His character, His glory, His power, and the coming display of God's justice and judgment at the end of this earth, we stand between the two. We look back to see what God has done, and we look forward to see what God will do. And in light of those two things, we get a clear picture of who God is and the urgency of us to respond to God appropriately. So take this to heart. As we've seen them in the days of Exodus, so we will see again uh, very, every false god exposed as impotent, powerless, 
and every false security proven unreliable. What are you relying on today? So let's take a close look at these uh, plagues in Egypt for the purpose of anchoring our hearts in the fear of God as our only sure foundation. The first plague we saw last week in chapter 7, uh, where the Lord turned the Nile River into blood. Not only did God render the river useless, but He did it to expose the Egyptians' vain belief in the false gods associated with the Nile River. And you may recall that when Pharaoh's sorcerers uh, uh, mimicked the miracle by their satanic powers, Pharaoh hardened his heart. He refused to obey Yahweh by letting the people go. But today we're going to pick up with the second plague, the plague of the frogs. So turn to chapter 8 with me, verse 1. Plague of the frogs. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. By the way, whose people? God's, Pharaoh's people? No, God's people. These are my people. Command, let them go. Why? So they can serve me. What's their purpose? To serve the God of heaven. It's our purpose too. Verse 2. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will plague all your country with frogs. The Nile shall swarm with frogs that shall come up into your house and into your bedroom and on your bed and into your, the houses of your servants and your people and into your oven and your kneading bowls. The frogs shall come up on you and on your people and all your servants. And the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the canals, over the pools, and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. But the magicians did the same by their secret arts and made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called Moses and said, Plead with the Lord to take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go and sacrifice to the Lord. Moses said to Pharaoh, Be pleased to command me when I am to plead for you and for your servants and for your people that the frogs be cut off from you and from your houses and be left only in the Nile. He said, Tomorrow. Moses said, Be it as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs shall go away from you and your houses and your servants and your people. They shall be left only in the Nile. So Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried to the Lord about the frogs as he had agreed with Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. The frogs died out in the houses and the courtyards and fields, and they gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Frogs everywhere, right? Even in their food. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? One of the things you're going to see about these plagues is that there is absolutely no possible way for the Egyptians to get away from these plagues at all. Okay? And yet this infestation is more than a mere nuisance. This is an attack against the Egyptian goddess Hecht. Depicted as a frog's head, and thought to be embodied in frogs. They believed that Hecht controlled the frog population, so a a proliferation of frogs humiliated their god. He wasn't in control. To paraphrase Charles Spurgeon, here's your gods, O Egypt. Have your fill of them. All right? Go for it. Here you go. To make matters worse, because the frogs were worshipped and considered sacred, they could not kill them. Not a thing they can do, right? So, why frogs? Well, the Egyptians believed that their goddess Hecht assisted women in childbirth. You may recall now, back in chapter 1, Pharaoh tried to persuade the Hebrew midwives to let the Hebrew baby boys die. You remember that? When that didn't work, he issued a command for the Hebrew baby boys to be thrown in the Nile River. 
So it's not surprising that the very river that Pharaoh used as an instrument of genocide was turned into blood, and hence the frogs came from. And the first Egyptian goddess to be humiliated, goddess that is, was the one thought to govern labor and delivery. You see what's going on here? It's not just like, frogs are not just a creative idea. God is speaking to Pharaoh's sin directly. Once again, as in the first plague, Pharaoh's sorcerers were, they were able to replicate the miracles by also increasing the population of frogs. How did they do this? How did they copycat this miracle? Well, you may recall from last week that they dabbled in satanic powers. And interesting enough, I couldn't believe when I saw this this week, I never made this connection before. In Revelation 16, and I believe it's the sixth bowl of wrath that God pours out on the earth, John sees three demonic spirits who performed signs, and you know what they look like? Frogs. Interesting, huh? Well, the sorcerers could multiply the frogs, but they could not get rid of them. (laughs) Only Yahweh could do that in answer to Moses' prayer. And I want you to notice here this morning that the death of the frogs, at the specific time Moses promised, adds to the miraculous nature of this plague, and it indicates that the Egyptian's goddess is dead. Piles of frogs stinking everywhere in the land. And why this timing? There's a specific purpose in verse 10 that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. Pharaoh had promised that he would let the people go if they removed the frogs, but as soon as Pharaoh got a little relief that he wanted, he hardened his heart and broke his promise. And by the way, verse 14 specifies how all these piles of dead frogs made the land stink. Do you remember... What the Hebrews said to Moses and Pharaoh when their workload was increased, you have made us a stench. You've made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh. How ironic that Yahweh would now make the Egyptians' goddess a stench in all the land. Plague number three, the plague of gnats. Let's go down to chapter 8, verse 16. Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth so it may become gnats in all the land of Egypt. And they did so. Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth. And there were gnats on man and beast. All the dust of the earth became gnats in all the land of Egypt. The magicians tried by their secret arts to produce ants, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Well, it's difficult to know exactly what kind of um, gnats or bugs these were. The, The word used here in, if we were to... Uh, The the same word used here in modern Hebrew is the word lice. (laughs) Yeah. Kinem. Now, I don't know if it was lice. That's the word that is in modern Hebrew. But modern Hebrew and and, uh, biblical Hebrew are not, they're they're pretty distinct these days. The earliest Greek translations of the Old Testament used the word, the general word for gnats, which some have even thought to refer to mosquitoes in their association with the river. And yet, Pinpointing the exact species is irrelevant. The point is that gnats and mosquitoes, lice, fleas, they all have one thing in common, don't they? Uh, They can drive you crazy with misery, especially if you're covered with them, right? This time, when the magicians tried to replicate the miracle, they could not do it. They said, this is the finger of God acknowledging that Moses and Aaron were not mere magicians or sorcerers like them. They had witnessed a supernatural act by the hand of God, but again, Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not listen just as the Lord had said. Plague number four, the plague of flies. 
And the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh as he goes down out of the water and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. By the way, that message never changes. Not one word changes. God's plan, God's commands do not change. He will not alter his plans for the stubbornness of men. Verse 21. Or else, if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and into your houses, and the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. On that day I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people dwell, so that no swarms of flies shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Thus I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall happen. And the Lord did so. There came great swarms of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses throughout all the land of Egypt. Throughout the, excuse me, Yes, throughout all the land of Egypt, the land was ruined by the swarms of flies. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your God within the land. But Moses said, It would not be right for us to do so, for the offerings we offer uh, shall sacrifice to the Lord our God are an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice offerings abominable to the Egyptians before their eyes, they will cast, uh, they, will they not stone us? We must go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he tells us. So Pharaoh said, I will let you go to sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you must not go very far away. Plead for me. Then Moses said, Behold, I am going out from you, and I will plead with the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from all his people. Tomorrow, only let Pharaoh... Only let not Pharaoh cheat again by not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord. And the Lord did as Moses asked and removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. Not one remained. But Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. Well, there are a variety of flies that could be referred to in this plague. A number of ancient sources, uh, like the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which, by the way, was written in Egypt. Many of these ancient sources um, indicate that these were dog flies, which are blood-sucking bugs. But more importantly, again, than the kind of bug... Um, is the fact that many Egyptian gods were associated with flies. One in particular was Beelzebub. And by the way, that's not on your chart. I forgot to put it on your chart. Beelzebub, which literally means Lord of the Flies. <laughs> Interesting, right? Many Egyptians worship Beelzebub to shield themselves against swarms of flies and other natural disasters. But Yahweh was using this plague as a means of stripping the Egyptians of any confidence in their false gods. Gnats, flies. By the way, don't overlook the fact that God can use even the smallest creatures as a means of discipline in His hand. Charles Spurgeon said, When it pleases God by His judgments to humble men, He's never at a loss for means. He can use lions or lice, famines or flies. In the armory of God there are weapons of every kind, from stars in their courses down to caterpillars in their hosts. It's amazing. Can you imagine a world ruler having that kind of access to resources? Can you imagine a world ruler ruler being able to to fight battles with hailstorms and tornadoes and hurricanes and tsunamis? Can you imagine? Being able to fight battles with locusts and bugs? Well, some, (laughs) some nations are probably trying that. What's unique about this plague, however, is that it is... It is the first one in which God makes a clear distinction between Pharaoh's people and God's people. The Egyptians are overwhelmed by the swarms of flies, but the Hebrew people were completely unaffected. 
Verse 22 states a specific purpose for this, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. I'm not only God, the only God, but I am here. And I will make distinctions on this earth. This time Pharaoh didn't even bother to call his sorcerers. Rather, he tried to negotiate. I'll let you go sacrifice to the Lord as long as you stay in the land of Egypt. But Moses reminded him that sacrificing bulls would be an abomination to the Egyptians because bulls were considered sacred in Egypt. So you can imagine. Remember earlier, Pharaoh was concerned that oh, there's so many Hebrews that there could be a civil war and they could overtake the country. And, and basically Moses is reminding him, hey, look, at, uh, this could create a political crisis for you. So Pharaoh said, well, I'll just go a little way into the wilderness, but not a three days journey. <laughs> Friends. Negotiating with God is a sign of a hard heart. God expects full and complete obedience because He is God and His ways and His commands are always right. Compromising obedience to the Word of God is always a step away from God. Always. Plague number five. The plague, of, the plague on livestock. Chapter 9. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will fall with a very severe plague upon your livestock that are in the field, the horses, the donkeys, the camels, the herds, and the flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing of all that belongs to the people of Israel shall die. And the Lord set a time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. And the next day the Lord did this thing. All the livestock of the Egyptians died, but not one of the livestock of the people of Israel died. And Pharaoh said, And behold, not one of the livestock of Israel was dead, but the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. By, this, by the way, Pharaoh's heart is hardened at the end of every single plague. Every single one of those exceptions. Now there's an important detail in verse 3. It is the livestock that are in the field. Okay? In the field that will die. In other words, those that are out to pasture. Late in, uh, late in the year, as the floodwaters began to recede in Egypt, the farmers would put livestock out to pasture, but they would do it gradually as the floodwaters were receding. So there was about a, a month's time where they had divided about half of their livestock from pasturing and half that were still back in the stables. And as verse 3 specifies, it was only the animals in the field, the pasture, that died. This, by, the, re the reason I'm pointing this out is because it explains how there are more cattle, will, how more cattle will die later in the plague of the hail. You say, all the cattle died. We're, we're all the cattle now in the plague of the hail. Well, it's the ones that were in the stable that didn't, didn't get the plague. By the way, note the level of specificity in each of the plagues that confirms that these are supernatural events and not just natural phenomena. I mean, it's the whole point of Exodus 8 through 10 is that God is working supernaturally, right? Moses specifies when the plagues start, who they will affect, who they won't affect, the degree of their impact, and when they will end. There's, there's a lot of specificity in these things. So there are ten plagues, but there are more miracles than that, right? Because every time God stops a plague, it's supernatural as well. And notice uh, they stopped abruptly and absolute, with absolute finality. For example, not one fly remained. Or later, not one locust remained. Okay? This plague against the livestock was not only a financial blow, but a massive attack on Egypt's gods once again, many of which were depicted as livestock, especially bulls. Isis, interesting name, the queen of the gods, was depicted with cow horns along with the goddess Hathor. The worship of Egyptian gods associated with cattle was so prevalent <laughs> that when the Israelites rebelled against God in Exodus 32, what did they make? The image of a golden calf. 
Again, they're not just being creative. It's the idolatry of Egypt that they're returning to in Exodus 32. And again, here the Lord made a distinction between His people and Pharaoh's people. Only the, the Egyptian cattle in the fields died, but nothing that belonged to the Israelites died. But again, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. All right, let's go to plague number six, the, the plague of boils. Now we're getting a little more personal, right? Chapter 9, verse 8. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of soot from the kiln, and let Moses throw them in the air in the sight of Pharaoh. It shall become fine dust over all the land of Egypt and become boils breaking out in sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. So they took soot from the kiln and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses threw it in the air, and it became boils breaking out in sores on man and beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils came upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh and did not listen to he, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. Nothing gets somebody's attention quite like physical suffering. And the Egyptians are now plagued with it. Painful open sores so severe that Pharaoh's magicians could not even stand before Moses. It's debilitating. All right? Some of you, probably all of you, have experienced a, a, a severe form of the flu. Right? And it takes you down. You're just done. Life is put on hold no matter, no matter how badly you want to not be on hold. Some of you have experienced migraine headaches. They can just take you down. Right? That's what's happening to these boils right here. I mean, the whole nation is just disabled, <laughs> sick, pain. What's particularly intriguing about this plague is that God has Moses use soot from the kiln. Think about this now, the kiln. Likely a kiln that was used for making bricks. Pretty possible. One scholar suggested that the furnace was a symbol of the oppression of the Hebrews, the sweat and tears that they were shedding to make bricks for Pharaoh. Furthermore, when Moses threw the ashes up in the air, he was doing something that Egyptian priests often did because they believed that casting sacrificial ashes in the air was a sign of blessing. But Moses is demonstrating that what they believed was a blessing was actually a curse. But even more pointedly, this plague of boils was an affront against Egypt's gods. Ammon Ray, we'll hear more about him later. Ammon Ray was their creator god and healing physician. Thoth was their god of healing arts. Imhotep, uh, Imhotep, however you say it, their god of medicine. Sekhmet held the power to create epidemics and bring them to an end. <laughs> so much help they are. The result of this plague was that Yahweh humbled the sorcerers. He humiliated the Egyptian gods and hardened Pharaoh's heart. And yet, I want to just point out this morning, we would be wise to take heed to Revelation 16, which speaks of another plague of boils when God pours out the first bowl of wrath on the earth, harmful and painful sores on those who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. Together, you see, both Exodus 9 and Revelation 16 make it clear that God will not share His glory with another. And the only means of escaping the wrath of God is to surrender our hardened hearts to God, to Christ, whose death and resurrection alone reconciles us to Yahweh. Plague number seven, the plague of hail. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and present yourself before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues on you yourself 
and on your servants and your people so that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. For by now I, I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence and you would have been cut off from the earth. But for this purpose I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. You are still exalting yourself against my people and will not let them go. Behold, about this time tomorrow I will cause very heavy hail to fall such as has never been seen in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. About a thousand years, by the way. Verse 19, Now therefore send, get your livestock and all that you have in the field into safe shelter, for every man and beast that is in the field is not and is not brought home will die when the hail falls on them. Then, catch this, whoever feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh hurried his slaves and his livestock into the houses. But whoever did not pay attention to the word of the Lord left his slaves and his livestock in the field. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, so there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, on man and beast, and every plant of the field in the land of Egypt. So Moses stretched out his staff toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and fire ran down to the earth. Lightning. And the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. There was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail. Very heavy hail, such as, uh, such as had never been in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hail struck down everything that was in the field in all the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And the hail struck down every plant of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the people of Israel were, there was no hail. And Pharaoh sent and called Moses and Aaron and said to them, This time I have sinned, the Lord is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. Plead with the Lord, for there there has been enough of God's thunder and hail. I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. Moses said to him, As soon as I have gone out of the city, I will stretch out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease There'll be no more hail, so that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, I know that you do not fear the Lord God. The flax and the barley were struck down, uh, were struck down, for the barley was in the ear and the flax in the bud, but the wheat and the emmer were not struck down, for they are late in coming up. So Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and stretched out his hands to the Lord, and the thunder and the hail ceased, and the rain. Uh, The rain no longer poured upon the earth. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet again and hardened his heart, he and his servants. So the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people of Israel go, just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. This plague of hail now begins the third cycle of plagues. You notice in your chart there are three cycles, right? The first cycle, the first three, create discomfort in the land of Egypt. The second cycle of flags create destruction. And now the third set of flags is going to create desolation uh, on the land. In other words, no more business as usual as far as the plagues go. It's becoming intensely personal between Yahweh and Pharaoh. In verse 14, the Lord said, This time I will send all my plagues on you yourself. That doesn't mean that everybody else isn't going to get it because he makes that clear in the next phrase. The Hebrew literally reads, on your heart. (laughs) Why? Because Pharaoh postures himself as a deity, but the Lord is going to make it clear that Yahweh has no rivals Verse 14, so you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. In other words, the category of God is singular. And by the way, it was thought, the Egyptians thought that the heart of Pharaoh is what maintained order in their world. Not so. Now let me paraphrase verse 15. By now I could have wiped you off the face of the earth, but I raised you up this evil king, I raised you up 
and restrained the full force of my wrath to make a name for myself in all the earth. That's verse 15. Take note here that God raised up Pharaoh to the throne of Egypt for the purpose of judgment so that we would know that God is holy, just, and unrivaled and worship no other God. By the way, if you think that's a little unfair to Pharaoh, (laughs) God did not put any desires in Pharaoh that he didn't already have. Pharaoh was just as stubborn and wicked uh, now as he was from day one. Verse 17 Pharaoh is rebuked for still exalting himself against God's people. And don't miss the life principle here. To exalt yourself against God's people is to exalt yourself against God himself, who identifies with the suffering of his covenant people and will vindicate them with justice. In other words, the most risky thing you could do on the face of the earth is to persecute the people of God. For a time, you might think you're getting away with it. But God's justice has no shortages. And yet notice there is an an element of mercy even here in this plague. And it's, it's preceded by a warning. That's mercy. There's a warning in verse 19. Now, pay close attention again to verses 20 and 21. Whoever feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh hurried his slaves and his livestock into the houses. But whoever did not pay attention to the word of the Lord left his slaves and his livestock in the field. So they're warned, take cover, take cover. Some did, some didn't. The life principle here is this. Our response to God's word will be the determining factor between mercy or judgment. Because you cannot separate God's word from God himself. Some Egyptians are beginning to fear the Lord, but not Pharaoh. Oh, he made the perfect confession in verse 27, didn't he? I've sinned, the Lord is right, and I'm wrong. But as soon as the consequences of discipline were lifted, Pharaoh proved that his heart was not truly repentant by sinning again and further hardening his heart. There's there's another life principle for us here. A true confession is validated by a humble heart of repentance that forsakes one's sin and embraces true obedience to God. Well, Pharaoh's many uh, false gods could not deliver him from the wrath of the Almighty. And the same is true for us. Revelation 16 renders yet another warning for those who harden their hearts against the Lord in the last days. The seventh and final bowl or plague of God's wrath that will be poured on the earth will result in utter destruction with massive earthquakes and great hailstones weighing as much as a hundred pounds each. It's Revelation 16. Can you imagine? I have concrete blocks, landscaping blocks, 70 pounds. Concrete's more dense than, than ice is, right? How big is a 100-pound block of ice? Can you imagine? You think golf ball size hail is bad? But it'll be too late. Not because God failed to give a warning. We do have Revelation 16. But because men's hearts will be so hard, they will only curse God and refuse to repent. Again, remember, you're standing between Exodus and Revelation. Beloved, we've been given the example of Pharaoh and the warnings of Revelation 16 so that we might heed God's word, so we might fear the Lord, that we might repent of our hardened ways, that we might trust in Jesus alone with a heart of full obedience. Plague number eight. Get close. The plague of locusts, chapter 10. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. Say it with me, that you may know that I am the Lord. Let me remind you here from last week that when God hardens Pharaoh's heart, it is a judicial hardening. Remember that? What we meant by that is that 
God is hardening Pharaoh's heart as a means of bringing judgment against Pharaoh for his evil ways. And the Lord is working out his judgment against Pharaoh through these many plagues to demonstrate his power and glory in such a way that every generation should fear and honor him as Lord. By the way, we see this worked out in the Old Testament. Other nations far from Egypt talking about what God had done in Egypt for the Hebrews, spreading through all the earth, through all generations. Friends, the most important thing that God wants you to know is that He alone is God, a God who, ex- a God who extends mercy to those who trust Him and judgment to those who defy Him. Everything else in your life is to be weighed and determined by who God is and your calling and purpose to serve Him. Verse 3. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. By the way, this is a very good question in verse 3. For all of us to consider. How long will you refuse to humble yourself before God? How hard must life get? How heavy must God's hand of discipline be? If you've been holding out on humbling yourself before God, I would urge you to stop right now and pray, Lord, please give me a humble heart to stop resisting your lordship and your discipline and your wisdom and your grace in my life. This is like the most important thing. That you have a humble, tender heart before God. Nothing else matters. God will take care of everything else. You need to get right with God. Verse 4. For if you refuse to let the people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your country and they will cover the face of the land so that no one can see the land and they shall eat whatever is left for you after the hail, and after and, and uh, excuse me. And they shall eat every tree of yours that grows in the field. And they shall fill your houses and, and the houses of all your servants and all the Egyptians, as neither your fathers nor your grand- grandfathers have seen from the day they came on earth to this day. Then he turned and went out from Pharaoh. Now you might be wondering how in the world, after all that hail and the last plague, how in the world is there anything left for the locusts to eat? Well. Remember back in chapter 9, verse uh, 32, we discovered that the wheat had not yet come up when the hail came. Remember that? So the hail wipes off everything that's living on the earth, and now the the wheat comes up, and the locusts come in and devour it. I mean, this is just an absolute nightmare. You can't can't over-exaggerate. You can't overstate it, right? Verse 7. Then Pharaoh's servant said to him, How long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord and their God. Do you not yet understand that Egypt is ruined? So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh, and he said to them, Go serve the Lord your God, but which ones are to go? Moses said, We will go with our young, with our old. We will go with our sons and daughters, with our flocks, our herds, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. But he said to them, the Lord be with you. If ever I will let you and your little ones go, look, you have some evil purpose in mind. What a manipulator. What a, what a blame shifter. This guy, he's just hard. Do you see how hard he is? It doesn't matter how painful life gets, he won't give in to his hard ways. Verse 11, no, go the men among you and serve the Lord, for what is, th- that is what you're asking. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Once again, Pharaoh is trying to negotiate here. Do you see that? He's trying to negotiate with compromised obedience to the Lord by not letting the men go, or, or by letting, uh, only letting the men go and holding the women and children back as, as ransom. But God doesn't play these kind of games, does he? So look at verse, verse 12. And the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every plant in the land, all that, all that the hail is left. 
So Moses, we know how the story goes, right? So Moses stretched out his hand, right? His staff over the land, and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day, all that night. When it was morning, the east wind came and brought the locusts. The locusts came up over all the land of Egypt and settled on the whole country of Egypt. Such a dense swarm of locusts had never been before, nor ever will be again. They covered the face of the whole land, so the land was darkened. And they ate all the plants in the land and all the fruit of the trees that the hail had left. Not a green thing remained. Neither tree nor plant of the field through all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh hastily called Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against the Lord and against you. Now therefore, please forgive my sin. Only this once. Only this once? I pleaded the Lord your God only to remove this death from me. So he went out from Pharaoh pleaded with the Lord, and the Lord turned the wind into the very strong, a very strong west wind, which lifted the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea. What is that prefiguring? What is that foreshadowing? The death of the Egyptian army, right? Not a single locust was left. Not one. In all the country of Egypt, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people go. All right. Again, Pharaoh makes this fake confession a plea of forgiveness that is void of any obedience, but God knows his heart and judges it with further hardening. Now, plague number nine. Here we go. The plague of darkness. Chapter 10, verse 21. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was pitch darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days, but all the people of Israel had light where they lived. I can, for, for the life of me, I cannot imagine what that looked like. A wall of darkness, light here, full day, and complete blackness over here. That's impressive. Verse 24, Then Pharaoh called Moses and said, Go serve the Lord. Your little ones also may go with you, but let your flocks and your herds remain. What? Uh, he should have been a used car salesman. But Moses said, You must also... Oh, by the way, I, please forgive me if anybody here sells cars. <laughs> that was a horrible thing to say. I just have memories, you know, of dickering back and forth and uh, <laughs> and how good I felt when the salesman finally said, fine, I'll give you a tank of gas. <laughs> my dad was so proud. Anyway, a little window into my depravity, perhaps. Verse 25, but Moses said, you must also let us have sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Our livestock must go with us. Not a foot shall be left behind. You're not going to cheat God. You're not getting out of this. For we must take of them to serve the Lord our God, and we, we do not know with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. He would not let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, Get away from me. Take care never to see my face again. For on the day you see my face, you shall die. Moses said, as you say, I'll not see your face again. This ninth plague of total darkness and isolation for three days is a precursor to death, as we'll see next week in the tenth plague. When verse 21 says it was a darkness to be felt, it appears there was a heaviness of dread and despair an emotional depression, perhaps, that accompanied the physical darkness. The only light was where the Hebrews lived. Now, it may seem as though a plague of darkness is somewhat anticlimactic after the first eight. But can you, can you imagine the cumulative effect on the, <laughs> the souls of the Egyptians after eight plagues? And if you've ever struggled with bouts of depression, 
This is not anticlimactic for me, right? This darkness is deeply personal because Pharaoh was not only a sun worshiper, he himself was venerated, at least listen now, as the son of Re, the great sun god and the greatest of all the Egyptian gods. Jesus is the son of God Yahweh. Pharaoh was pretending to be the son of Ammon Re. Okay, you with me? This plague declares that Yahweh, by the way, they, they thought Ammon Re was the creator God, ultimate God. Okay? This plague declares that Yahweh alone is light and that Pharaoh is a, is, is a mere man of darkness and that light is displayed among God's people alone. After nine plagues, Pharaoh will not surrender a heart of full obedience to the Lord. He tells Moses and the people to, they, they, can, they can go with their children but not their livestock, yet Moses insists that not one hoof will be left behind. Why? It's, it's full obedience or no obedience. Church, there's no partial obedience. When we were raising our kids, we had a phrase we used a lot in our house. <laughs> Obey right away, all the way, with a good attitude. If you don't obey right away, you're not obeying. If you don't obey all the way, you're not obeying. And if you obey with a bad attitude and a chip on your shoulder or a whine, that's not the right heart. Pharaoh apparently didn't get parented very well. <laughs> Again, we stand between the example of Exodus and the warning of Revelation 16 where the fifth bowl of wrath that God will pour on the beast and his kingdom is horrific darkness. Listen, leaving the unrepentant to gnaw their tongues in anguish. Yet even then, they will only curse God and refuse to repent. Hardness of heart is a really serious deal. The reason I keep bringing up Revelation 16 in our, in our study of the plagues is to remind us that Exodus is not just an ancient story for us to muse at, while God may be at work in different ways throughout history, He is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. These things have been written so that we may know that Yahweh is the Lord. Yahweh is the Lord and there is no other. His glory is unrivaled in all the earth. He is a God who will render final justice on this earth and only those who humble themselves in submission to Christ will escape the terrible holy wrath of God. Let me tell you, Revelation 16 makes Exodus 8-10 through 10 look elementary. Exodus reveals the true God. He is almighty. He's sovereign over creation. He's sovereign over mankind. He is a jealous God who will not share His glory with another. He does not compromise or negotiate, but calls us to full obedience. He will execute justice and punish those who sin and refuse to repent. But He is also a God of great mercy. Don't forget that in every plague, God is extending mercy to His people. God is preparing them for freedom. God is lifting the power of their slaveholder. God is merciful to those who cry out to Him for mercy. And beloved, God's justice and God's mercy meet at the cross of Jesus Christ. There God's wrath for sin falls on Jesus and His mercy is poured out, lavished on all who trust in Him. For those who refuse His mercy, there awaits the most severe plagues of God's wrath ever to be seen, ending in the finality of hell, not death. Death would be relief. But for those who take refuge in Jesus, there is not one drop of divine wrath left to be endured. Not one locust, not one fly, not one shadow of darkness, for Christ absorbed it all. 
That's the story of the Bible. And there remains for us only mercy and grace and blessing for all eternity. So the question this morning is, this is it. Who is your God? Who is your God? By your very design, you are a worshiper. You do worship something. You have worshipped something. You are worshipping something. You will worship something because you were made for God. So it'll be either Him or it'll be something else. If you, if you do not serve and worship Yahweh, the one and only true living God, then you will serve a false God. It will only prove to be vain in the end. As vain as Ammon Ray. There's no end to the things that you could give your heart to in place of God, including yourself. But you must know that every false security will be proven unreliable. And every false god will be exposed as vain. That's why we keep going to Revelation 16 while we're in Exodus 8-10. through 10. How long will you refuse to humble yourself before God? How long? You might be thinking right now, the sermon's way too long. And it's God's mercy to you that in this moment, you're confronted with the reality of the living God. And this living God, as just and holy as He is, is a God who has offered the ultimate mercy to you in His own Son. How long will you put off faith and trust and full obedience Christ. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart. Yahweh is the Lord, and there is no other. His glory is unrivaled in all the earth, and He offers Himself to you in the person of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray this morning Cause our hearts to see Lord forgive us we've exalted so many things in our lives we've exalted so many things they're as worthless as flies and frogs gnats we have sought to exalt ourselves oh Lord we have sought to find our pleasure and our satisfaction and our refuge and our comfort in lesser things. And God, we thank you this morning that though you are God, holy and good, who will not wink at sin, you're not merely an angry God, but a God who lavishes his mercy on anyone who runs to you. God, give us tender hearts. Draw us to yourself. And give us eyes to see the vanity of the secondary things we've been trusting in. You are the Lord. You're the only one. You have no rivals. And your glory is the only one that can satisfy the deep longings of our heart, created in your image to know you, to serve you, to love you, to be satisfied by you. So Lord, make, up, make your home in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.